Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, when Steve asked me to do that, I said, why do you have any there? I haven't done any research in five years. I became an administrator. I don't have the time to do research. Uh, I did this type of research. I liked it. But when you become an administrator, it becomes very difficult to do this type of research. So, uh, so I, I, like Steven said, I've been involved for many, many years at IUPUI in different roles. Uh, it is true, I probably have all the title, acting, interim, founding, official, you know, I, I'm serving all the capacities in here, so, uh, so anyway. So I would like to, you know, begin my talk to give you a little bit about my background, because a lot of people think, you know, like, you know, you, people go straight through of the process of going into what you, you know. First, I never thought I was gonna end up in this position. Never in my life gonna end up in this position, never. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the process. I, I came to Indiana. As you can see from my accent, I am not from Indiana. I am from Puerto Rico. Uh, and the only reason I'm in Indiana is because I play basketball. And I ended up in DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. And originally, I wanted to do engineering. And I took calculus and physics and all these dead languages, COBOL, Fortran, BASIC, uh, that totally nobody uses now anymore. Uh, and then I was always involved in sport, play basketball, play tennis, competitive tennis things like that. I ended up switching. I became a physical education teacher, education major. Uh, I did my student teaching, and Mark knows this, middle school, and I say, I am not doing this for the rest of my life. <laughs> that was an experience. <laughs> so I decided, I see, I'm going to go into coaching. And then when I was doing my bachelor's degree at DePaul University, the professor at, at the top biomechanic is Dr. Roy Harder, who's still a professor in, at Texas State. A university. Uh, he taught biomechanics, and I thought, you know what, this is great. I mean, by engineering, sports, I, I, I really enjoy that. I said that I went and did my master's at uh, exercise science in biomechanics at uh, Indiana State University, uh, and I was very lucky. They just hired a brand new biomechanic from the University of Maryland, Dr. Ralph Finch, which I still in contact with his, my friend, we travel over the world. And, and he, I work with it, set him up the lab, and I'm working with biomechanics over there for a year. He really wanted me to go to Maryland, and I disappointed him. I know that because I wanted to go to Bloomington, and it had nothing to do with academia. It had to do with like, my girlfriend was in Indiana. Uh, so I ended up in Bloomington, and I did my PhD in human performance uh, and, and with Dr. Jesus de Pena, uh, who we retired several years ago. He is a world-renowned biome sports biomechanist. He, he was the authority for many years in high jump analysis. And you can see from some of the research that I was involved, uh, we did all the analysis for the Olympic Committee in high jump for many, many years at Indiana University. Uh, and, and I got an opportunity to travel and meet Olympic athletes, and that was, that was part of that research. So. Um, and then you know, over the years, I switched from sports biomechanics. I did more clinical, things like that. But in, in, in the nutshell, that's the path that I took to, to become to, to uh, my research career. So what is the role of sports biomechanics? In sports biomechanics, most, for most, in the most cases, basically is a study of forces and effects in humans and exercise and sport. We look at movement patterns. How do the athletes perform this movement? And I'll give you a perfect example in a minute. A lot of times, we don't know how the athletes perform this movement. They chose to move in a certain way. Is that the most efficient way to do it? We look at optimization of performance. Once we know that the movement is the right movement, how can we optimize the performance of this athlete? We look at equipment testing. Those are fun to do. Uh, is this equipment better than this other piece of equipment? Is this tennis racket better than this tennis racket? Or this shoe is better than this other shoe? And we also inc include injury prevention. Is this type of movement patterns gonna create an injury to the athlete. So in general, those are the things that sports biomechanics plays, you know, basically studies. And I'm, you know, what I decide to do, like I was telling you, I have not done research in the last five years, so I'm not gonna tell you anything new. But what I wanted to tell you is, over the years, I've done research in many of those areas. I'm gonna give you a glimpse on some of the research that I've done over the past 20 plus years that include many of those areas that we have in here. So, for example, High jump. This is a pure example of how a technique changed overnight. Okay, before 1968, all the high jumpers used this. Every single high jumper in the world will jump like that. In the 1968 Olympics, Dick Fosbury came in 
and did this. Um, people were like, what? What is he doing that? That's, is, is that? is he breaking the rules? And he won. And nowadays, every single high jumper jumped like that. Why this is better than that? Well, it took a little bit, and then people in biomechanics started exploring why is doing this is better than that. And there is a tremendous advantage of doing what we call the Fosbury flop. You know, but this is an overnight. The technique changed, and it was actually produced by an athlete. I mean, you know, before 1960 Olympics, nobody has ever jumped like that before except him. You know, so, so to give you an example of how things change, they could change overnight. All right. So let's begin a little bit with equipment testing. You know, I've done a lot of equipment testing. I have grants from equipment testing. And I can tell you a lot of the claims by betting sports equipments are questionable, to say the least. Okay? Things don't really work like they tell you to work. There are people that are trying to do what? Sell you things. Okay? There's very little regulation in terms of equipment testing by the government. They, you know, they're not. The FDA kind of supposedly oversees some of that. But they, don't, they have bigger fish to fry. They got COVID. They got other things, you know, drugs, you know, so they don't really care. But so a lot of the stuff that you go in the market in there that they claim is sometimes it's not really works. They're all a cheaper alternative or, 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 or doing something else. So, so let me give you the first glimpse. So my first grant at Boston University was by this company called Active Ankle. I know Jay is familiar with the company. Uh, they were beginning to introduce the active ankle. They did develop some prototypes of the active ankle, and they give us funding to do three studies. Uh, the number one, we're looking at the strength and range of motion of the active ankle compared to their competitors. The main competitor was there was, uh, uh, what is that called, Jay? The, the one, that, the t big one? It's, it's not the Suido, the Aircast. The Aircast was the main competitor, which is irrelevant now because the Aircast bought Active Ankle. They're the same company now. So they, they, they you know, so we, we, we test their, the Active Ankle and we compare with regular tape, the other type of active ankles, and we look at their ankle joint strength. So we use an isokinetic machine, they push on the machine, they're in the range of motion. The Active Ankle allow the biggest strength, the biggest range of motion, so therefore, you know, we say, okay, yeah, the Active Ankle was the best. Uh, then the other active ankles, and the purpose was published in the, uh, I, think the in, uh, I think it was the Journal of Leg Training, I think it was. I don't know why, I should have moved that up a little bit. Um, so then in the second study, we want to see does the, act, does the active ankle prevent sprains? So we develop a platform like this. In a, in back then, I didn't have pictures. We didn't have you know, a platform like that where the person will go in, and we basically simulated an anchor sprain. The person didn't know which side of the thing, and then we had a high-speed camera on the back, and we simulated an ankle sprain. We stopped it to the point uh, that it didn't sprain the ankle. And, you know, the problem was that the active ankle was not the best. The, actually, the air cast was the best in preventing that. And then what the a second study, a third study we did is, okay, we, let's go to force the, the, the ankle brace to bend. So we basically had a treadmill. We tilted, and we had the people running on a tilted treadmill and see how the ankle, with high-speed cameras, we can see how the ankle behave and see if the, if, the, if the braces were doing anything. Well, in the last two studies, the ankle, the active ankle was not the best. Actually, Erica's was the best. And this is, again, a lesson in uh, uh, the first lesson that I got. I was ready, we were ready to present the data for the other studies, for these two studies. And we get a call from the Office of Research. that you remember all the paperwork that you signed at the beginning? That the data belonged to the company? And I don't know, I just signed a bunch of papers. You cannot present the data. They belong, the data belongs to them and you cannot present the data. And that's what I think I tell people. A lot of times companies allow you to do research. Like for example, I can call Nike and I say, we're doing a shoe study and we will give you 50 pair of shoes, and Nike will send me pictures, and they send me a contract that says, if the data is detrimental to Nike, the data belongs to Nike. Why they do that? They don't want bad publicity. 
Now, the university nowadays don't let me sign papers like that anymore. They will, they will not allow that. Back then, I was allowed to sign it. So basically, the other two studies that we did were never published. They were basically in some drawer in my, in my office because the active ankle was not the best. Actually, the, uh, the air cast was the best, the best, air, the, the best of, all, of all the ankles. And again, now it's irrelevant because active, uh, air cast bought active ankle, and there's one big company now. All right. Here's another one that, again, you know, I was for 10 years, I was the biomechanist for the USTA, the, uh, the Sports Science Committee. And a friend of mine was a very good friend of the guy from the Dene company in the USA. And Dene put a new racket out that he had all these claims. These rackets prevent tennis elbow because they have less vibrations, then prevent tennis elbow. And so he, my friend, um, Mark Kovitz, asked the guy, have you tested those rackets? They said, no. So how do you know they prevent tennis elbow? So he sent it to me, and then and the guy said, okay, we will give you a small grant so you can test the rackets. So we brought them into the lab, and this is actually a student project. Uh, we brought them into the lab, and we, we, the, we created a little device to test the tennis, oops, just, little device to test the tennis rackets, uh, which basically this is an accelerometer, so we can measure the vibrations of the racket. And they were set up on a pendulum and this is a standard design that they use in engineering to test this type of systems. And we just basically take a ball, attach to the thing, and we drop it into the strings, and we measure the vibrations, and we can calculate the frequency of the racket, uh, the vibrations that are generated by the racket, and, and so on. And, and we did find out that they basically is true. The, the new rackets that came out, they really reduced the vibrations quite a bit. So if you look at the, on the bottom line over here, so here's the old racket, they vibrated a lot. Once they hit, they vibrated. And then the new rackets, basically the vibrations were stopped immediately. Well, the reason they stopped immediately is because these rackets were very, very stiff. It's like having a hard piece of metal in there. So they, they give you less vibration, but they give you a big shock, you know? So the other problem with this is there's no really link association between tennis elbow and vibrations. There's, you look in the, oops, sorry, this is my ring camera. So, I mean, we gave the report to the company. This is like a white paper. We gave the report to the company. They continue advertising the rackets and things like that, you know, but, but and again, this is an example of a lot of times what the manufacturers are putting out, sometimes they don't really test some of the stuff that they do. All right, this is another one that it was actually uh, the stick. The stick is this device, because you can see right here, is one of the first ones that came out. This is, you know, and we did that in here in NIF. Uh, and we did what we, did. the company that generated, produced the stick came to us and said, we'd like you to test the stick. We know it works. The US track and field actually uses it, and they continue to use it, and they swear. You look at the athlete, they swear it works. So Dr. McCaskey, who is a professor here, and several of us got together, and we developed a study in which they actually were using university athletes here. And then we developed a study and when we actually get, they have three treatments. They did the stick. Then we came up with an all EMG machine that was unhooked. And we hooked these electrodes to the athletes and we told the, like, the athlete that they were getting insensible electrical stimulation. That was our placebo. Okay, it wasn't even hooked up at all. And then we have visual imagery. The, the athletes were imagining doing all this series of tests, vertical jump, 40-yard dash, flexibility tests, and things like that. So they will come in, they'll get the treatment, one of the treatments, and they go out and they get tested in all this, this physical activity testing. Uh, I was the one who's giving the test, and you'd be amazed at the placebo effect. Some people were complaining to me, oh, this thing made me really sore yesterday. It's, it wasn't even hooked up. It was, that thing wasn't even connected to electricity, you know. Or can you turn the electricity down because I can feel it. And I had to pre pretend with a straight face to turn the knob down because it wasn't even working, you know. But anyway, what happened was, that, you know, the stick really didn't do much help for most of the, the claims that they did, except that improved the 20-yard dash. It was a significant improvement in the 20-yard dash. 0.02 seconds, maybe? Well, it depends who you talk to. If you're talking to an Olympic athlete, 0.02 seconds is the difference between goal and zero and nothing. You know, 
Uh, and so it did help the athlete, track and field athletes. Uh, and we have about 40, 50 subjects in this study. Um, and, and it helped, and the study was uh, in the Journal of Strength Conditioning was published. Uh, and again, you know, a lot of people use now similar things. The stick was the first company that did. But this is a company that was very sure of the stick, and they, and they up front, they said, the data is here. If it doesn't work, fine. You know, they were very honest and they were forward about, you know, it's yours, you can do whatever they would do with your data if it doesn't work. All right, this is not a really sports study, but this has had to do with it's probably one of the most impactful things that I've done. Uh, Dr. Kerry Thompson was a, uh, a graduate student here. He was a Navy guy doing a PhD in cell biology and anatomy here, and he worked in our lab. He was a physical therapist. And once he graduated from his PhD here, he went to the Great Lakes Navy Training Center. He was a director of training for the Great Lakes Training Center, where they, all, the Marine, all the Navy goes and the recruits of the Navy goes. That's where they ended up going for basic training. And when he was there, you know, he looked at the number of stretch fractures on, on the recruits was huge. And you think about it, they were over there, they give him these boots. Here, you're gonna run on these boots, you're gonna work on these boots and hard sole boots, and no wonder you got all these people that they were not very in shape, and they were getting, they were running in hard sole boots that they were designed to be in an aircraft carrier, and they can withstand a temperature of a thousand degrees fire on there because it's in case of the fire in an aircraft carrier. So he began, and he came and talk, we came and started talking and saying, you know, can we, can we think we can design something better? So we talked to the shoe manufacturers that they provide the thing, and we asked the shoe manufacturers, can you do a better job with this? And they said, sure. They said, so we tested some running shoes, like Nike shoes and things like that, and then we tested the, the original boot, and it was like, it was night and day. You know, these are very cushiony, this is very nice, and everything like that. So he went back to the Navy and said, look, this is one the reason why they're getting all the stress fractures. So the, the manufacturer of the, sh of the boots this came up with a shoe that is like a boot, but it looks like a tennis shoe sole, and it can withstand the, re the, 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 the requirements, the, fi the fire retarder requirements that the Navy produced, and then he came back and tested it. I was like, we came back in the lab and tested it with a force platform, and he was able, and he was, he took literally, I mean, I didn't do that, he did the work, it literally an act of Congress to sign out and change the boots. And now they're completely designed in the boots. They're completely designed the boots. They no longer use the hard sole. They use these things that look like a, ten, like a boot, but it's actually a tennis shoe sole with meet all the requirements. But it, it took a lot of work to do this, for him especially. I, did it. I just tested the boot in the labs. But. All right. So here's another one. This is a student project that we did. Uh, you know, you've seen this in, on the market. This headgear for soccer players, shock absorptions, you know, and things like that, they work. There's some studies that have shown that, it, you know, that some people have done some studies with shooting balls in it. And, you know, we didn't have those kind of money to do that, but he said, you know, let's, let's test them and see. So what we did was we got this three most common headgear for soccer, for soccer. And then well, obviously we cannot have a human being with this headgear and shoot balls at 50 miles an hour into the head or having hit a solid pole. So what we did is we came up with a medicinal ball, which is about the weight of a human head. And then we strap that to the medicinal ball and then we'll drop that into a force plate. The force plate measures forces. So we drop the medicinal ball without the headgear and then drop the medicinal ball with the headgear so make sure they land properly. And we find out, okay, what are the forces generated by, you know, uh, on, the, on the ground by the different headgear, as you can see, is no differences, you know. So the question is, does, does this thing really do anything? You know, the, there's no really difference if you look in and see, you know, from the, from the amount of force generated, there's very, very little difference. So. So, you know, you start questioning, you know, and people are paying for this and people are buying this. But the manufacturers don't do any testing on this. They don't, they, they're not required to do any testing, you know. So. 
All right, this is the problem most recent. Dr. Strippy was part of it, you know, on this one. And um, Dr. McCaskey, who was an exercise physiology professor here, he retired a few years ago. His son was uh, a track athlete. He was a state champion in the, uh, in the hurdles. And uh, in track and field, there are different track of spikes, different type of spikes. Uh, there are the needle, the traditional needle spike, the pyramid, the pose, the Christmas tree, modified Christmas tree. There are different types of spikes, and spikes manufacturers tell you, well, these this spikes do not penetrate the track because they're not sharp, they don't penetrate the track, and what they do, they push on the track, and they really help you to propel you forward. And it's like, okay, sure, and I got some land in Florida that I want you to buy, too. Uh, so what we did is we tested the hypothesis. You know, this really, this is really what happened. So we actually got spikes, and we actually called the um, the top uh, track uh, track uh, manufacturers, which is Mundo. They sent us samples from the from the track, and then we went to engineering and we asked them to use what is called the Bose Electroforce. is basically a machine. That, that basically pushes things, or they can do all kind of testing. It can push this thing, it can measure the force in and out, it can also measure the velocity in and out. So what we ended up doing, we took the pieces of track over there, as you can see, and we tested all the spikes, and we developed what we call the low deformation curve. This, was the, this is going, the spike going in, and this is the spikes going out. This is the force generated by the spike to go in, and this is the, the absorbed force and things like that. Well, we find out, yes, the pin, the pin stripe doesn't give you very much, you know, energy return. The other spikes go, but all the spikes penetrate the track. That is a myth. They all penetrate the track with, you know, I think it was, you know, less than, you know, less than the body weight, of somebody's body weight. They all penetrate the track. You know, so you think about it, you have those spikes on the ground and you do this, they're going to penetrate the track. And the reality is none of them really give you any absorption because even these strikes, even those, those, those ones that they, they claim that they don't penetrate the track, they do. And when they penetrate the track, they're harder to pull out because you got, you know, you got this, this design in here. So they're harder to pull out. Now, if, in, ideally, if they don't penetrate the track, yeah, they might compress the track and push you forward, but the reality is they do penetrate the track, and then they're harder to pull out. So they really is not, they're not beneficial. Uh, so now, and again, we didn't test a shoe with all the spikes. That could be different, but I really doubt if one single spike does this behavior, I doubt if the whole set of spikes is going to be a different behavior. It could be, but we didn't do, we didn't do that. Um, so, all right, so the next topic is sports performance research techniques and analysis improvement. So, again, since I was in Bloomington and then when I went to Ball State, I was involved with the USOC, USOC Olympic Center and we developed the high jumps. Uh, we, you know, we developed the high jump. Uh, we did multiple projects for the high jump. Uh, let's see, I don't know if you can. Uh, if you can hit the video, there's a video, supposed to be a video associated with that, with the picture, with the big picture. Yeah. So, you know, we got to the point that we actually doing optimizations, uh, computer modeling comp optimization. So basically, we were able to tell the athlete, look, once you leave the ground, if you put your hand over here versus over here, you're going to jump half an inch higher because we can program the computer to do that, that type, of, that type of, of, of optimization. When you're in there, you can do that. When you're in the ground, you can't really do that. Uh, and this, I like this picture because this kind of dates me. When I started biomechanics, we were doing this. And when I finished, we were doing this. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, you know, when I started in Bloomington in 1982, there's only one computer for the whole campus. There was no... You know, nothing like we have now. I mean, this, this thing probably have more power than the computer in Bloomington, you know. Uh, but we, we, you know, we were able to, and this is one of the things, so we were every year for many years, we did it for about 10 years, we would go to the top meets in the United States, we'll film the top athletes in the United States. We also film, and we have an opportunity, the top athletes in the world, 
so we can compare their techniques to our techniques, and then we will generate this big booklet, as you can see, 230 pages, 174 pages, which each individual athletes they said, this is what you're doing, this is what you should do, and we go to Colorado Springs, and we meet with the coaches, and we meet with the athletes, and we, we talk to the coaches and things like that. Good and bad, very successful for some athletes, and some of the athletes that were not successful. I remember we give this handout to the coaches, and some of the coaches on the way out, they will just drop the thing in the garbage, and they just walk away. Uh, some athletes were very good. I mean, some athletes, they were excellent. They talk to you, and they try to change their performance and things like that. But, you know, but, you know, we become to the point that we were able to optimize athletes' performance by telling the athlete where to put their arms and legs and things like that. That would make them jump higher, you know, with computer modeling, computer simulation. All right. My dissertation was in tennis. I played tennis. So the, by, when I started doing research, most of the research was in tennis. Uh, I did, my dissertation was on the tennis surf. I did look at the different movement patterns on the three types of tennis surfs, flat, slice, and topspin. Then I became involved with uh, looking at the uh, forehand uh, and, um, and forehand open. You know, if you look at professional tennis players, they hit now with an open forehand like this. Uh, and then what happened versus a traditional tennis stroke is like this. And then teachers were start teaching little kids hitting like that. Well, the orthopedic surgeons are concerned. I mean, you know, you're open like this. What is going to happen to your shoulder over the years? You know, this is a more powerful stroke, and you get your body way behind. So we got a grant from the USDA looking at the different types, the mechanics of the open forehand versus the uh, closed forehand. Um, ended up like really, if you want to hit the ball harder, you can hit the ball harder this way versus this way. You can hit a lot, the ball a lot harder this way versus this way. Why do you think professional athletes hit the ball this way? Anybody play tennis here? Huh? Pace? Exactly what it is. You don't have time to turn, step, and do this. When you're hitting a ball that's coming in at 140 miles an hour on a serve, you don't have time to do that, so you do this. You can hit the ball a lot harder this way. If you have time and you turn and you step, you, that is a lot harder and it's less strenuous to your shoulder, actually. You know? But the pace of the game has changed tremendously, and that's, it's, the athletes have adopted that technique, and now people are teaching little kids that technique. They no longer teach the traditional technique. We'll see in the future what is the, what is the business for the orthopedic surgeons in the future and see what happens. Um, we also, I also look at part of my dissertation, angular momentum. It's basically, what are the body rotations during a tennis serve? What do the, the tennis players do? Because again, up to now, nobody has really looked into that. And really, it was interesting, because what a tennis, during a tennis serve, what a tennis player do is basically, they, they hit like this, they turn, they do this, and they, they're pretty much a somersault. Okay, and that somersaults allow them to get the arm backward like this and create this huge stretch shortening cycle of the shoulder so they can generate this huge amount of uh, serve velocity, you know. Um, so that's what, you know, um, part, of the, part of the stuff that I did with, uh, with tennis. But a lot of, I did a lot of research with tennis. One research that, again, wasn't published anywhere because it didn't go anywhere. You're talking about, you know, what I was, we were part of the USDA. Uh, if you watch the game of tennis with professional players, it's kind of boring, the men's side. Actually, the women's side is more interesting now because they're rallies back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In the men's side, it's pretty boring. You know why? I mean, these guys can hit the ball at 140 miles an hour. If you ever play tennis with a professional player, if you never play tennis, you don't see that ball. You just The women's are hitting, you know, the Williams were hitting 120, 130. Okay, the game is so fast now, so obviously the U.S. the U.S. Open ratings will start going down on TV. The USCA generates about seventy percent of their revenue for the U.S. Open. So if people don't watch the U.S. the U.S. Open, what happens? They don't get any money. So they wanted to think. They start thinking about about how can we get the people attracted back to the game. Well, we need to slow down the game, the men's game especially. 
So how are we going to do that? Well, we can control the racket. There's a bazillion rackets manufacturers. That's too difficult. So how else can we do it? Well, we can control the size of the ball. We can control the ball manufacturers. There are only two or three, Penn and Spalding and Wilson. So they actually produce these oversized tennis balls. And I have a can, one of the few cans left. There's only two in the can. Because if you increase the size of the tennis ball, what's going to happen as the ball travels through the air? It slows down because of the drag, and then the players have a bit more time to hit the ball. It was proposed, and they say no. <laughs> they, uh, they decided not to do the project. <laughs> uh, but you know, they made it to actually, they actually have tennis ball made for the study, you know, so. All right, this is another student project they did several years ago. Uh, we had a student, uh, um, Tony Gutierrez, who's now a, a prosthetic guy, and we look at the difference between a squat machine and a regular, uh, the regular squat. If you're familiar with the Smith machine, the Smith machine basically forces you to be in a plane. Okay, uh, are there differences? A regular squat with the Smith machine squat? And the answer is no, absolutely not. The Smith machine forces you to become in a plane, and as you can see, what happening here, right here, over here, this is the motion. This is the knee position, bar position over the squat, and basically forces you to be in a single plane. So you're basically forced to be like this until you can go any farther. With the squat, you don't do that. With a regular squat, you actually move your body to a position, your legs in, in, a, both, in a better position. So they, you know, sometimes the Smith machine actually puts your knees with more, put, you put more stress on your knees because it's forcing you to do something that is not very natural to do it. I mean, what is the advantage of a Smith machine? I mean, what's really, what's the advantage of a Smith machine, a regular squat? Do you need a partner to do that? <laughs> no, it's safety. It's, it's all safety. I mean, there's no really advantage of having a Smith, you know, doing a Smith machine. It's all safety. You don't have to worry about, you know, you get, you know, falling or dropping the weights or anything like that. Uh, so anyway, that's, that was a study that we did with uh, Tony Gutierrez several years ago. We presented that in Ireland. All right, uh, this study was done at Ball State. Uh, the most common test to determine power output is the vertical jump. Does it really represent power output? Well, not really. I mean, it's pretty close. So let's say you have two individuals. So you got somebody my size. So, you know, two individuals. I'm 250 pounds. The other person is 180 pounds. We both have the same vertical jump. Who has more power? We both have the same vertical jump. I do. Why? Because I have to lift my big body weight up. <laughs> the other person was 180, doesn't. So the vertical jump by itself is not a pretty, you know, it does pretty well, but it's not pretty. To really measure vertical jump, power, leg power, you have to have a force plate. A, ma a machine that measures the forces that you make on the ground, and then you can actually calculate, you know, power accurately that way. Okay? When we did the study, there was really, there were equations to calculate power that they would, so you don't have to use the Verica jump, but nobody has really did a study and we actually had the people jumping from a force plate and doing the vertical jump simultaneously. So what we did is we used athletes at Ball, at Ball State, but we got close to 100 athletes, that we actually jump from the force plate, perform a vertical jump, and then we can calculate the power generated by it, from the force plate, and when then we can create what was called a regression equation that allows us to calculate peak vertical jump and average vertical jump without having a force plate. Pretty accurately, because our equation included vertical jump, the vertical jump that you measure, the mass of the person, and the height of the person. And so we were able to develop those equations, and basically all you have to use those equations, put it in. If you have the vertical jump, you can actually develop a very good measure of peak, ver peak power and average power during, you know, during a leg power, during a vertical jump, without having to have a force plate or anything like that, you know. All right, so that's it, that's the end. I hope I gave you a glimpse of some of the stuff that I've done.